in the years that we were working in corporate we quickly understood that the corporate life isn't for us we didn't like working for somebody else and there was always something going on that we wanted to create a legacy brand we wanted to leave behind something that is uh, you know monumental and that couldn't have happened uh, within the corporate setup so even though i really loved my job in corporate we left like within one and a half years and started our business Hi everybody welcome to the Dollar Diaries today we have an amazing set of guests uh they are the co-founders of Booked Cafe uh and if you haven't been there what's wrong with you yeah um, <laughs> introducing Reshmi and Pat hi guys how are you doing hello yes it's hello. our pleasure to be here <laughs> it's our pleasure to host you as well uh Reshmi Pat before we get started into this what was the spark behind Booked Cafe Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so I think we've been together since a long time, and the story started even before we knew it started. Actually, so we were in college. Uh, we were in this college called Mitti Bai, that's in Bombay, and most of our eleventh uh, and twelfth we spent outside the college as opposed to inside the classroom. And our food exploration journey actually began there. So we would eat some of the you know dirty Chinese on the road, some dosas, some sandwiches. We didn't know that this was research, but years later. we realized that we wanted to have a brand a legacy brand uh that combined the love for food for community and that's how the booker cafe started and yeah sorry and and at that point in time i think so we opened back in 2018 and you know uh we f- we found that there was a lack of good uh indian street food places over here that sort of uh, encompass all of these uh concepts of you know community food uh and and the sort of events that we do whether that's stand up comedy live music so we thought let's you know create something unique uh i i mean i've probably said this uh, a dozen times but we sell nostalgia we don't sell food mm-hmm. we just monetize using food uh you know we want people to be transported back to india because all of us over here are expats and you know we sort of miss home somewhere or the other so we with the booker cafe we sort of want to recreate that experience for our customers over here Yeah. and bookard is like a there is a word behind i don't know hindi so so yeah. bhook bhook in hindi means hunger okay. bookard is somebody who is always hungry who is always craving for food and i think so that's every one of us you know we're always i mean at least between the both of us we're always planning our day one meal at a time you know at breakfast we're thinking of lunch at lunch we're thinking of dinner and i think so that's uh, it's just a love for food that sort of uh, got us into this yeah. and but also like, it has a, it has a double meaning because it's hungry we are always hungry not just for food but for knowledge for expansion for growth and for more so this was the thought process behind yeah. keeping uh, the name as the booker cafe and also our tagline goes stay hungry stay booker so it's another word to keep exploring for more so what came first the brand name and the idea behind it or is it something that came later to justify the name no i think the first step was coming up with the name and yeah. right in the beginning only we knew that we wanted to create like a big franchise brand mm. so it had to be the name had to be catchy the name had to be a conversation starter so everything was related uh, like from the beginning we thought about it well before you know conceptualizing the other things like menus and the concept and everything yeah. and this book the cafe uh, the restaurant business it, it is a very you know like a lot of people say like we've had a lot of guests who say like restaurants one of the businesses they are most afraid of because yeah. of the high costs and high this yeah. thing were these some of the things that you thought of when you were starting out and mm-hmm. how do you find that changing over a period so not time? really i mean now that we have sort of been operating for the past 6 years uh, and we've been operating in karama which is sort of like like the khaugali of uh, dubai it's it's like the hub of a lot of restaurants uh, the quickest way to lose your money is to open a restaurant all right uh, but having said that if you do it right you can make a decent amount of money uh, when we sort of went uh, head on into the business we didn't really think about all of this we just wanted to create something that we loved uh, create the community we didn't really think on what the profitability was going to be or or anything of that sort we just went on with it and uh, the sort of love and response that we saw from the customers made us realize that we have created something that is far larger than us and that's how we start, started to expand our vision and started to think about this uh, you know in in the bigger picture and uh, when we saw this we it, it, within the first year of operations uh, we had a lot of customers come in and ask us for for the franchise and we weren't from the fnb business back then and we were just young new entrepreneurs that got into this for for our passion and love and uh, we sort of realized that you know what this 
can expand and we can make something big out of this and that's when we started to plan and uh, you know meet with consultants develop our franchise model and once we did that uh, we sort of plugged in a lot of numbers and we saw that we can definitely look to expand this and scale this and make this into a, a profitable franchise model and yeah. it's not like you know your typical mcdonald sort of franchise right there is an ambience and there's like a for a lack of better terms a vibe <laughs> when you enter booker cafe you know what you're here to experience that atmosphere what was the background behind it and i know you mentioned that you want to bring india yeah. over here sort of a situation yeah. but like what went into the design the aspects of that because i've worked in interior design and it is one of the most head scratching thing i've thought about mm-hmm. right like the colors this that yeah. styles and this thing but when you come into booket cafe it doesn't feel like a typical rustic interior it has yeah. like its own sense so, and own taste so so we we both are, are very creative people all right and we love design we love art uh, and we are from bombay so we see that in bombay there are a lot of cool uh, new concepts and cafes that there's a lot of cafe culture in bombay and we've been to uh, kala ghoda in bombay which is again a very colorful uh, festive place uh, the kala ghoda festival where they have all these shops over there and uh, india in general is a very colorful and cultural place we thought of uh, sort of ca- so uh, what's the right word we we thought of uh, capturing that when we sort of design our cafes uh, when you visit our cafes you'll see you know a lot of desi elements you'll see clothes hanging from the line you'll see the the rustic blue color from and the raw walls that we create uh, you'll have a cement seating with the tree in the middle which gives a sort of village sort of a look and feel uh, we do the brick wall uh, so we try to you know sort of capture elements of india in in various forms we have the chai tapri uh, where you know we have the chai glasses and parle ji's kept it's it's like when you, when you walk on on any street in india you'll see these elements in and around and that's what we try to create in our cafes my mom is an interior designer all right so i sort of derive some sort of inspiration from her <laughs> um but in general i mean we both are sort of creative people yeah. so i think we lean into our uh, memories of our childhood memories of our growing up years and uh, the buzzword here is authenticity okay. i see a lot of indian restaurants trying to be indian they would just put a random thela and some colorful decor but it's not well thought out uh when you're authentic when you have that authenticity in your brand you would uh, think about each and every element that you're putting in so it's not just the food when the food comes in you're also hearing a certain music you're also looking at the music and uh, you you're looking at the walls and reading something so it's the idea is to capture all of the senses while you're eating that food so that it transports you back to an era that you have left behind a good part you mentioned is your background right like you you did college in india you done your uh, university also in india no, you, no, no so in dubai so we are mechanical engineers yeah. from bits pilani dubai, dubai campus. Okay. we okay. moved here in 2008 uh, we graduated in 2012 mm. worked for a couple of years and then started our first business um in the years that we were working in corporate we quickly understood that the corporate life isn't for us we didn't like working for somebody else and there was always something going on that we wanted to create a legacy brand we wanted to leave behind something that is uh, you know monumental and that couldn't have happened uh, within the corporate setup so even though i really loved my job in corporate we left like within one and a half years and started our business and you asked before as well that what were you thinking in terms of financing and whether the business is going to be profitable or not the biggest strength we had at that time was that our minds were not tainted with doubt we were young so we jumped into it without too much resistance and thought and it worked out so it's yeah. just a, it's so when you came you came here dubai specifically for university is that right yes and what was that transition like from being born raised in india because i'm born raised in dubai adi you're born raised in dubai as well zainab's also born raised in he's been all over the place that doesn't count uh so you know we've not been in india very frequently and to see something that like captures india in like hey i go in this and this is what the ideal india looks like yeah. Yeah. right what was that transition for you like like so, from so, moving to so when we were back in bombay we were in uh, this college called mithi bai and uh, there's there's a very good vibe and culture of that college and the u- universities around it uh, a lot of eating culture a lot of event culture uh, you know a lot of uh, clubs that that the college has and when we came over here uh, i think so it was sort of a shock because uh, dubai was not what it is right now 
all right there was, our, our college was located in an academic city yeah. and it was all desert all around <laughs> all right back in 2008 and you know i, I still it's, remember it's still a desert town it's it yeah. still is but i mean a lot has come up in the in the area and you know i think so they they strategically placed the university over there away from all the malls and away from all the distraction uh, and it it was sort of a shock but we sort of adapted uh, in into what was uh, what, what we were offered over here and our campus was was a nice place we had almost 600 students in our batch alone and you know we had first year second year third year fourth year and like a good variety of indian students on campus so we did meet a lot of good people from our college uh, and we sort of eased into it you know once you get into engineering i don't think so you have time to think about a lot of things uh, with with a course as rigorous as bits has and we sort of managed somehow yeah <laughs> and what was your college experience like considering that it was a huge shock for you guys it was good college was good i don't want to say anything bad about it because a lot of people complain about the hostel food and all of that but ours was pretty good pretty premium and uh, there was a culture shock in the sense that back in india of course you're with your family you live in a very cocooned uh, atmosphere like the environment. environment is completely different but once we were here we had to quickly learn how to be independent and i think that independence is also something that is a quality to have to be to have when you're an entrepreneur so i think we learned very early on how to be independent how to do things your own way not rely on other people and yeah but well, i mean back back in back in india in, in our houses i mean we we were pampered to a whole different degree you know your your clothes get washed your clothes get ironed you know they get placed in your cupboard you have you know house help that sort of makes food for you you want a snack that's it's easily available and you know you demand something from your mom and she cooks up the food right away so it's it's very easy and a very cocoon environment but when we came here uh and this was our first hostel experience so there is a particular time where you have to go to the mess you know breakfast is served at a certain time you attend lectures so it's sort of adulting in in a way of sorts and uh, you have to do your own laundry i still remember i mean you know uh, i used to carry my clothes in in the laundry basket from my <laughs> block all the way to the to another block where they had the laundry and you know you had to purchase coins and put it into the machine so it was a exciting experience all right <laughs> and uh, during exam times i still remember we should sit uh on top of the washing machines and just open our books and study wait for our clothes to get washed then put <laughs> load them in the dryer wait for them to get dried and we were studying meanwhile so it was a very unique experience it was fun yeah and sort of circling back right yeah. you after university you started working and you mentioned right like you figured out hey this isn't for me i want to like mm. all these things what was that spark like where did that come from because they, for me when i think about like i haven't been working for very long yeah and i think about like hey i have to go in 9 to 5 do somebody else's work they, they basically like hiring me to do their work yeah and i just keep like looking at like where does this debt loop sort of stop for right. you guys what was that push to say hey no this ain't it so i think uh, the push i mean a situation had arisen where he had actually lost his job the company that he was working for uh, got dissolved and he lost his job and we were to get engaged in the same month okay. so we decided not to tell our families about this and we got engaged anyway and in the back burner we started working on this plan saying that okay i will continue working for the next 4 months just to keep the cash coming in and in the meantime we can sort of start our marketing agency we we thought of opening a marketing agency because it's the easiest thing to do it's a services business the licensing cost and the startup cost isn't all that much and while we were working in our corporate we already sort of had started uh, making connections and networks with our clients back then so we sort of had a couple of clients in the pipeline that would work with us so we we didn't have much yeah. resistance at that time and we just said that you know let's do it because you know if we don't do it now we are young when are we going to do it that's i i still remember we uh, to start our first business we uh, she had a friend who was working in uh, a company called petrofac where she was interning and you know he sort of lent his credit card to us all right and i think so he he roughly had a 20000 dirham limit on the card he said you know use use it and pay it off whenever you can all right and that sort of gave us a kick start uh, you know we did all the licensing and the office stuff uh, using his card and we we sort of it, it it was a calculated risk because we had a client already that was ready to come on board uh, but again in business uh, things don't always go as per plan you know we were supposed we were scheduled to start on a certain date and that got pushed by 30 days so that was the first learning lesson that you know you sort of always have to plan uh, a little ahead in uh, a little ahead in time 
and uh, I still remember when we started the business with that client, we got, received our first check you know, like within a month or 15 days. And I still remember that that the, the value on the check was roughly 90,000 dirhams. And uh, I, I still, I mean, when you come from a salary of say six or 7,000 dirhams a month uh, and you look at a check of 80 or 90,000 dirhams, uh, that, that's a big jump, you know, and that sort of sets things in uh, reality sort of kicks in. You know, and I think so she's your perspective, perspective, about, perspective money. about money, you know, and wow, you know, you can receive so much money. And I think so then there was, there, there wasn't any stopping us. We thought, okay, you know what, this is one client, uh, let's start to build up our client list. And we, I mean, uh, being from the industry, we sort of knew where to go, uh, who to speak to, how to speak to people. And we sort of started to get a role of clients and started to get them in, onboarded them and started. Uh, when we, I mean, when we opened the cafe in 2018, uh, that was more of something, uh, I mean, it was more of a passion project. All right, uh, and we wanted to create something like a legacy business that we can leave behind that people know us for, people remember us by. And that was the idea behind doing that. And yeah. And now it's... And now we've expanded to six locations <laughs> and many more. Yeah. Which gets me to the question, right? Like, what was that financing aspect of Booker Cafe? Did it purely come from the funds that you received through the marketing agency or um, so funds, we're a funds, completely yeah. bootstrapped, bootstrapped company yeah. i mean uh, currently now that in, in 2024 we have had people coming and asking us for equity and all of these things back in the day we didn't know about all of these yeah. things we are completely bootstrapped uh we had taken personal loans mm. uh because mm. business loans at that time wasn't an option because we were a new brand and yeah. uh, you wouldn't believe one of the biggest success stories that we both consider ourselves as is that we broke even on the Karama project in the first six months. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So anything that we earned post the six month period has been a profit to us for the Karama location. Yeah. And that is because uh, our time to market hmm. for the Booker Cafe was excellent. There was nothing like us at that time in 2018. Uh, we would have people coming all the way from JLD Marina to come and eat our food. I used to be in the kitchen from the morning till evening, chopping onions, guiding the staff how to serve a certain dish. He used to be on the cashier uh, counter. And, speaking uh, to customers, yeah. Speaking to customers, lost, taking feedback, you know, just, just in yeah. general chatting with customers. Yeah. We lost track of time, what day of the month it was. There used to be like queues outside for two to three hours. I don't know what kind of an era it was, but uh, even the, I mean, the numbers that we had done for in those days from Karama, none of our outlets currently have ever able to surpass those numbers. So it was something different, very unheard of in the hospitality industry. And why do you think like that go to market was very quick? Like, is there a, is it just a nostalgia that was fueling it or uh, were there like other efforts to push that. So the ambience and the vibe that we had created mm. uh, and the food and the offering, the entire package, nobody else was doing uh, in Dubai at that time. After we opened, a lot of people tried to copy us, but uh, ours was very, very original. And uh, that is what I call time to market. And we also did not spend a single dollar on marketing at that time. Mm. We did not have Instagram reels at that time. It was just more of a you know picture uh, format uh, app. Uh, but I think the people that came in through the door, they were the ones who did the marketing. The sort of word of mouth. Exactly, exactly. And I think so that's always the most, like the most organic or the most authentic form of marketing where, you know, people come in, uh, they like the food, you know, they spread the word and more people come in. And I think so there were some sort of influencers back in the day that were posting on Snapchat. Uh, Instagram wasn't that popular in terms of how it is right now. And I, I think so a lot, I mean, when I, I used to chat with a lot of customers and they used to say, we heard you on the radio, we saw you in some magazine, <laughs> we read it in some newspaper article and we had no clue of what was going on because, you know, I'm like, okay, please share it with me, you know, because we had no idea. We didn't sort of invest into PR. We just created something that we liked and it clicked, so. And that also has like a value to it, right? Like, so for example, I, I want to go somewhere and I see Booker Cafe, like, yeah. hey, this is a nice place to sit and chat. And that yeah. has a value that... Yeah. We, we often fail to put a number to it, right? Correct. So we always wanted to have the cafe, uh, you know, be, be, become something of a, a place where people can sort of come and hang out. They can come and chill, eat, eat the food that they like, uh, you know, and without sort of, I mean, there are cafes uh, that have, have a similar offering where it's not in a dine-in setting where you're standing out in the heat and eating. We thought let's, you know, sort of have Wi-Fi, let's have live music, let's do events, uh, let people come and watch something on the TV. Uh, 
in a, in a air conditioned place you know you know it's dubai it's, it's hot so people can come here sit chill enjoy good food good music and yeah and when i say that we don't uh, we did not invest in any marketing but with all of our outlets in the beginning the amount of effort and the thought and the fitness that goes into building the outlet itself is a form of marketing that is not recognized but it is there it's happening 6 months prior to actually opening it and what you mentioned was very interesting you were cutting onions yeah. this thing right like when people think about starting a business hey i don't want to cut onions i want to hire them yeah. what was that mindset like you, so you I, like you for the lack of better terms you got dirty so yeah. i think i me and him we know each and every aspect of the business uh, i may not know some of them that he does but uh, for, for example the kitchen and the marketing and the r and d ideation i know all of that and i had to be in the kitchen because these dishes were my innovation they were experiments that we both had late at night and you know created dishes out of so the chefs they are traditional cooks you know traditional chefs they would know how to make a butter chicken gravy but they don't know what's a butter chicken taco so i have to show it to them i have to show them the presentation i have to show that this is the condiment that actually goes with it and in the initial few uh, weeks of course the staff was uh, they went crazy because they wouldn't know how to uh, supply to the demand that we were having and at the same time they had to keep up with the new ideas that they were not used to in the beginning i remember that we had uh, we used to make keema pao uh, in the morning we would make 10 kilos and in by afternoon it would be over and the chefs would be like should we even make again because what's the point <laughs> because it keeps getting over and it takes time it's it's not a easy you know two yeah. minute job so we all went through it together i still have a uh, one of the staff that started with us back then and he remembers this period very very fondly and whenever we talk he mentions that oh my god that was like a crazy time and it, it's it's <laughs> always uh, recommended or advisable to sort of know each and every aspect of your business uh each and every uh department or function of your business because that's how currently when when we sort of franchise yeah. we can pass on this value to our franchisees all right and whether that's a technical aspect or an IT related thing or something that uh, you know sort of helps in sales vendors uh, operations recruitments all of that uh, it sort of helps them you know to learn from our experience uh in in the very beginning we've done a lot of things we've burnt our fingers uh, but we've done it at our, at our own cost and you know now we can provide that value uh, to our franchisees so that they don't repeat these mistakes and they are able to operate their business at a higher efficiency and it also comes to the fact like the people you hire you need to be able to qualify whether they are good or not right that does that play a role in knowing each and every So Zoom. this level of recruitment i mean we are talking about uh, junior level chefs and cooks it's not very easy to retain them as well so when we do hire them of course we try our best to recruit the best out of the lot that we have but at the same time uh, it is about the training they are not uh, supposed to think they are supposed to follow the manuals follow the recipes follow the directions that is already prepared so that is the advantage of having a franchise brand because you get a blueprint of everything our franchises don't need to invest time into thinking what to launch next they already have it they already are going to be informed about it and the staff is also going to be trained uh, you know ahead of time also also the success of anything any brand that is franchising or that's growing exponentially or uh, that wants to expand uh, one of the key metrics is to be more process dependent than people dependent because we live in a very dynamic environment and uh, yeah especially when you're recruit recruiting uh, junior level chefs or service staff they not necessarily are very loyal or will stick around i think so that's uh, i'm speaking on behalf of the entire hospitality community <laughs> over here we have the meetups and you know recruitment is one of the challenges we face uh, so hence we made the brand uh, or yeah we made made all all aspects of our brand very process dependent so that if anybody new comes in as well he has a blueprint um, you know a manual that he can just follow and follow instructions and just go for it and follow to the level that for example if you have a chai at any of our restaurants it is mentioned in a manual that the server is supposed to come with the kettle with the katta and pour the chai at the table that is the instruction level of detailing that is included in our manual so in in any of the outlets if you see that the chai is not served that way that means that they are not following that instruction we do have measures to even correct that we do have a retail audit team that we call that actually visits all of these stores every month and prepares a report of what's not right and how we can actually go ahead and improve them correct them uh, have you guys seen the tv show the bear which one the bear 
but no not yet no, you guys should watch it you probably will okay. relate like it's like about like a cook like they run a restaurant and it's just chaos left right <laughs> center okay. and they just like there's one episode where they shot the entire thing in like one uh without cuts okay. at all and just rotates between different characters going through uh okay. like different chaoses in this it okay. was the kitchen at bukat cafe chaotic <laughs> It always is it always not is. just the Karama <laughs> one, but every time we've had a new launch, of course it's chaotic because of the reasons I just mentioned. Because the chefs are trained, but they de- do need time to adjust themselves. Not just with the recipes, not just with the serving equipment and styles and all of that, but also with the flow of orders. Correct. And and we also sort of optimize the menu and new launches in a way of sorts where uh, you know they don't have to prepare anything that's brand new or completely new. Uh, we always try to mix and match with ingredients or uh, preparations that are already existing on our main menu, and then we sort of make spin-off items from that. Sometimes, yes, we do vary and we go a little uh, experimental when we're launching, doing some new launches. But again, we try. We always try to ensure that the load on the kitchen is not too much, uh, and that they're able to get the dishes out in time. Because that's, I mean, a customer's experience is good or bad. Uh, di- I mean, this one aspect of that is food, but the other aspect is also the time in which the food is served. Yes, and I think like the biggest trouble is that like when you do procurement for like ingredients, everything. We're talking about perishable goods, right? It's not like your typical stock. How do you guys manage that aspect of it? Because, like, when I think about a restaurant, the biggest worry is like, hey, what if I buy X amount of things and the X that gets spoiled or, or I am under. So, so a, a couple of couple of ways we combat that is one: we uh, all all food items are always made to order and they're always always made fresh uh, when an order comes in. So we keep minimal amount of items in inventory. So even if there's any wastage, our wastage, I believe, per outlet is roughly around under 2%, mm. uh, which is which is relatively healthy. And uh, we, yeah, I, I, think, I think so that's one of the main aspects. And uh, the items on the menu are designed in such a way that the kitchen doesn't have to prepare a lot of items and stock it up because uh, in traditional indian restaurants where you have a lot of gravies uh, and these and and the gravies are not used or served to customers in a certain amount of time they have to be thrown away and uh, given that north indian restaurants or any other uh, indian res- restaurants that have gravies with meat uh, the meat also is perishable so we always ensure that we make it fresh we try to keep minimal amount of storage time and the other thing is we try to align deliveries from our vendors Uh, on a regular basis so we can schedule maybe two to three deliveries from the same vendor rather than picking up a lot of inventory at one point in time we sort of break it up into say three deliveries i think that's a very common yeah. problem with indian food specifically right like a yes. lot of spices a lot of ingredients it's not bland yeah right <laughs> so that that also causes like the extra effort to make sure that hey this is the quantity we have to prepare and all correct. these things correct so correct. that comes with experience i think every outlet is different so yeah. once the kitchen is running for say a week or two the chefs they have an idea about weekday sales weekend sales the demand that comes uh, so they're able to prepare accordingly so after two th- two to three weeks of operating the kitchen they get into the automated zone and they know how much quantities is actually apt for that location and if i were to start a restaurant okay not yeah. bukat cafe yeah. <laughs> but if i were to start a restaurant what would that process be like how much am i roughly looking at as my starting capital so you can start get started first of all with the licensing licensing is pretty s- simple i think it will cost you anywhere between 15 to 20000 dirhams that's valid for a year and then it depends on the location that you end up selecting uh, mall locations standalone locations i would always recommend mall locations because uh, it's footfall footfall and also it's common misconception that malls are expensive actually they are not you Which need is to what I, like, yeah. behind the scenes we were talking i was pre- yeah. i didn't know if that like yeah. malls neither end up cheaper we. Yeah. neither did <laughs> we so once you start exploring different malls different landlords you try to understand what is it that they're offering versus the rent so our karama standalone location versus any of the other mall locations it's at par whereas the mall locations bring in the footfall they do their uh, dubai summer surprise sales they do discounts and all of that and we get customers for karama nobody is doing anything we are the ones who are doing the marketing the landlord is not involved in any other aspect so i would always go for a mall and then um, for example if you're looking at the cost you will have to prepare for certain uh, costs up front as you asked so 3 months of rental you need to have you need to have the security deposits and then you need to spend on building the outlet which is all of the mep work the kitchen equipment the interiors all of that 
um and, and then certification and all these things and then yeah then you yeah. get your li- uh, from the authorities you can get your certification so it really depends but a small size outlet can be open in under 500000 dirhams okay. a big size location about 1 million or and, more and yeah. you guys are not from this background we're like what was that now like, we are we were we back are, in you started the karama location yes. so, so what just, was that yeah, ju- just to add add to what yeah. she just said uh malls are also business entities right mm. and uh their rents are not uh you know just base rent they do have base rent they they sort of split it up into three parts where there's base rent there's service charges and marketing charges so uh, they're collecting these charges from all tenants that are there in the mall and uh, they sort of fund these summer surprises or su- super sales and their main goal is to sort of drive customers inside the mall so that they shop at various outlets uh, in the mall and that's how the mall also sort of benefits from uh, increased it's a footfall it's sort of a win-win situation it's it's, it's a win-win situation whereas if you have a standalone location like you said in karama a landlord doesn't really care uh, so so that's that's a key difference also when it comes to uh, costs involved in building up an outlet it completely depends at what stage you're taking that outlet so suppose it's a shell and core outlet uh, where you have to do the entire waterproofing mep uh, the, the ducting for the air conditioning just all for, all factors just to yeah. break it. What do you mean by shell and core for people who don't? Shell and so shell and core is something where uh, you don't have the raised ceiling. It's it's completely raw. All right, so you have to level up the flooring. Uh, everything is not done up. I mean, it's it's the outlet in the most raw raw form. Uh, the they they haven't even done the flooring. They haven't done the walls. It's it's all mm-hmm. raw, and uh, you have to take into account each and every step. So a cost to build up a shell and core outlet is far more. because there are multiple stages uh, you know waterproofing itself is a is is a big cost and say roughly a 15 day process all right given and if you're doing it in a mall uh, you have to use certain materials uh, of certain brands and that makes it a, a tad bit difficult and they also have different <coughs> times where you can work yeah 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 all that <coughs> so yeah. coming back to the question right like you when you started this you weren't from this background you wouldn't have been aware of hey yeah. this is step yeah. a step b step c what was that process like to figure out hey how so, do we do so we so figured our, out our, our first <laughs> our first contractor that we got in uh, sort of screwed us over all right and he did a half hearted job and he left in the middle uh, it didn't cost us much luckily so but but when we got our second contractor on board uh, he was very professional he helped us build the outlet ideate and you know come up with our entire concept uh, in terms of what we wanted where we wanted it uh, a lot of input was given uh, from our end as well and that sort of yeah it sort of worked and i think out. we both are uh, the kind of people that don't like to leave things on other people's heads yeah. so he's the one if, like i know a lot of people who would hire pros for a visa process or any licensing process because they're just simply lazy they don't want to find out what is the process but part he knows the system in and out yeah. that's because he's actually gone there and done all of these things hands on not just to save money but again as we were speaking before to know each and every aspect of the business right so that's how you learn when you're actually on the job and you're doing the practical aspect of things you learn it that's okay yeah yeah we're very hands on uh, you know in in terms of all of that and we are also very hands on in terms of interior design so we always sit down with our contractor no, that i've noticed like yeah. i you know every time i like we have guests and you know they like talk to us this thing you yeah. guys were like on your own yeah. world talking about <laughs> like this this the world so so <laughs> we we seek a lot of inspiration from any place that we go to yeah. all right and that's that's another reason why we eat out a lot and visit a lot of different places and cafes uh for definitely inspiration for food and in, inspiration for decor and design so yeah what, what are your thoughts about very it's, it's nice a pretty pretty, pretty nice place yeah, yeah. Nice. Nice. yeah. tell it to the guy <laughs> um the other side of things right like we like restaurant businesses are known to have like lower profit margins lower uh this thing and a big factor that would have affected places like booker cafe where experience sitting in in the place and experience rather than a take out option is covid Mm-hmm. right how did Correct. you guys manage around covid because like i've seen like a lot of good restaurants shut down yeah. during covid i and there yeah. was this one restaurant near my home which is like very one of my favorite restaurants and we used to play football together and like okay. the, he used to like buy shawarmas from there right, right before our football game uh and you know that place just shut down during covid and it was like heartbreaking but what was your situation like during covid because when nobody's walking in you kind of lose that business yeah right? 
So COVID was a very unique situation. I don't think the world was ready for anything like this. They've not seen it before. They're not going to see it in the future, hopefully. Uh, for the first three months, of course, we were completely shut and there was no revenue. But we still ended up paying salaries to our staff. We still had certain outgoings. But luckily, the government was kind of supportive. There were deferments on loans that we had taken. There were help from the landlord who was not charging the rent. So that period was fine. But when you mention about your uh, situation about the restaurant that shut down, lots of restaurants shut down, not just during COVID, but during these periods where certain aggregators also closed their business, online business. Now, that's where I'm talking about brand building. You cannot base your entire business on something else. For example, if there's an aggregator, you've built your entire revenue model on that aggregator. That means you're always dependent on a third party. We were very uh, sure and confident to never do that. We always focused on building our own brand, focus on our brand building and ensured that customers remember us for who we are. So COVID, apart from COVID, there was a recovery period, but then we found that our loyal customers came back to us. So, and that difficult period, I think we both supported each other a lot. Our marketing business supported the Booker Cafe a lot because that time all our marketing clients would uh, launch online campaigns and we made a lot of money and profit uh, from those areas. And we put everything back into uh, Booker because that's when this baby needed us more. I think so. As as engineers, we are very uh, <laughs> solution oriented people, all right. Uh, and we always find, I mean, rather than thinking too much about the problem, the the first step is to always find the solution to the problem uh, because that's the only thing that can save you from the problem. So, and that's my outlook in life. Uh, so, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Crypto was was <laughs> some sort of help. Uh, there was some sort of help from the buzz people as well. And yeah, we sort of somehow managed through the COVID period. And I think uh, we are not from the give up cl club at all. We yeah. wouldn't give up on something that we started without a fight. Yeah. And, and that too, this is something very personal to you guys, yeah. right? It's yeah. less yeah. like, I mean, yeah. it is a good business, but yeah. it, like the business came as you went on. This was like a, something close to your heart. You wanted to create that experience. So I, Correct. I and speaking of the buzz people, right? Like how yes. do you see buzz people as a complimentary thing to book at cafe or is it just another line so, of business you so guys are in most definitely it is complimentary because a lot of the marketing that we have sort of learned and done we've been able to apply all of that while opening our cafes yeah. you know and and uh, i think so one of our strong points is marketing the way we uh, put out co content on social media the way we ideate for content ideate for uh, dishes and concepts uh, we always derive something from marketing so i think so marketing is definitely the core of the Booker Cafe as a brand. Uh, and, and we yeah. pretty much do all of the marketing for the Booker Cafe in-house. Yeah. That way we've been able to save so much money. I mean, all the creators, all the social media, influencers, any kind of design work that you see at the Booker from the mm. server, all of that is done in-house. So we are not yeah. paying an external agency. And yeah. even now, like now, for example, the franchisees, we are able to support them with the market, like with the marketing in the exact same way. And they are also not paying industry standard rates. They are paying something way uh, below market average. Uh, the word yes. franchise keeps on coming. So for yeah. people who are not aware of the complete meaning of what a franchise is. Can you give us a description of what a franchise is? She's the is? franchise queen, so I'll, I'll let her take it. Yeah. <laughs> so franchising is the easiest way for any brand to go, grow. So a lot of people ask us uh, when you're opening outlets, why don't you open your own? Why don't you open all of them uh, on your own with your own money? Um, and my answer to them is I can do it, but till what extent? I can open 10 outlets, 15 outlets, 20 outlets, and eventually I'll run out of money, yeah. right? If I have to open 500 outlets, I need to figure out a way, a mechanism that makes this happen faster. And it's about scalability. Correct. So franchising and scalability, these are the two words that go hand in hand. So in a layman's term, if somebody wants to start a restaurant, they have no idea how to go about it. They want to utilize our system, our branding, our brand name, our menus, and all the expertise that we have. Then they are the a potential franchisee for us. And they would rather take our franchise than to do all of this themselves, which may or may not work. This is basically betting on a system that has already worked. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, we, have a rel we have a sort of proven track record of opening and op operating, say, X number of outlets. And, uh, you know, with the experience that we offer, 
with the trainings that we offer with the sops the manuals uh, the guidelines and the ongoing support uh, you know anybody who is from a non fnb background can always approach us and we can guide them how they can open and operate a franchise of our brand uh, and it's not just about signing the franchise it's also about ongoing support so currently uh, we help all of our franchisees optimize operations we help them to negotiate on rents we help them uh, in day to day operations you know minor things here and there and that sort of support is always there from us as the franchisor for our franchisees and i think the reputation that we have built it actually uh, lets us leverage this reputation in many ways so for example we were talking about mall locations if you were to start a new brand no mall is going to give you any space no non fnb experienced person can open any outlet in a mall so if we go with our concept and our name only then they are going to entertain you so it gives us access to different locations based on the reputation that we have created just to get to that point you mentioned you know franchise and scale goes hand in hand yeah. a lot of people have a doubt like or a confusion per se between what scale is versus what growth is how do you define or differentiate between what is scale in a business and what is growth in a business so growth can be slow and steady like i said if i want to open all of my outlets i can take the next 20 years to do that with my money and then you know the money that the outlet makes i can you know make a steady growth plan and do it but if i want to grow to 100 outlets i need to figure out something else and that's scale for me scalability is multiple numbers multiple boards that actually helps you multiply okay and the other question is like what is the process of opening a book at cafe franchise now it's pretty simple get in touch with us we'll have a nice cup of chai take you through the entire process and uh, yeah and if you don't mind me asking how much would it cost me compared to starting my own so business? now see now uh, what we have, we have also learned over the period of time so we have opened all of these flagship locations which is the backbone of our brand they are big beautiful outlets but this year onwards we are also going to be focusing a lot on express locations because we have realized that a lot of potential franchises they don't come with such a big budget so we found that uh, maybe you know having smaller locations in good high footfall locations would actually benefit the brand as well as benefit the franchisee so the express locations would cost you anything under 500000 dirhams uh, including everything start to end and if you want to go for a bigger size location it would go upwards of 1 million okay. this is including our franchise fees and it includes pretty much everything the trade license cost interior design mep kitchen equipment staff visa everything so the so advan- the, the the difference yeah. between uh, you know i mean the standard difference between opening your own outlet and uh, taking up a franchise of the bookard cafe uh, is uh, is only a the pre defined processes and yeah so yeah. so the value that we add is uh, you know we charge a franchise fee of 110000 dirhams or $30000 roughly mm-hmm. uh, that's a one time fee we we sign our franchise agreement for a period of 5 years and that's renewable for four additional terms uh, so that means you're signing the agreement for a period of 25 years and the 110000 dirhams is is charged only once okay. uh, and when we do this uh, in exchange for the 110 that we charge you offer a lot of value so we do we help you with all the the cost optimized vendors into opening the outlet recruitment vendors uh, food vendors for when you start operating uh, we do a 21 day comprehensive training program for the staff that's recruited at one of our locations where they're trained and gotten up to standard uh, and then the, then we have an ongoing uh, monthly royalties where we charge 7% on gross revenue we charge 2% which is a marketing expense and a 1% which is a global brand advertising just to grow the brand yes that seems fair yeah. moving aside from yes. all the business yeah. talk <laughs> uh what was your favorite food when you were in 11th and 12th grade skipping classes man so my my favorite was the mithi bai grill sandwich that i used to have outside mithi bai college and we have ensured that we have that on the on the menu of our cafes uh it's it's a three layer grilled cheese bombay grilled cheese sandwich with a lot of vegetables and beetroot and a lot of cheese and that that's one of my favorites and we serve it with a side of fryams and that goes perfectly with a cup of chai so i i like i like my adrak chai so yes what about you so i love the irani parsi culture in mumbai 
so there are a lot of these irani bakeries and cafes and they seem like they're from an era of you know early 1900s and they've not changed their look and feel the owner is like an 80 year old uh, grandfather who's still sitting on the galla and you know he's selling all these baked goods and my inspiration some of the dishes on the menu that we we've kept is bun maska for example bun maska is freshly made uh, pao and inside you slather butter and some sugar and it's had with chai and it's very nice and then there's akuri pao keema pao so all of these dishes actually are very very nostalgic to me so that's why we have yeah, it on it's, the it's, menu it's it's very difficult to pick one favorite you know we <laughs> it's it's like every day that we go to to one of our cafes we try something new over there and so. also in dubai right in, in the uae uh, it's also a lot about education we are indian food is not well known Yes. Indian food is known for its butter chicken naan and da- yes. dal makhani we, the stereotypical things we had somebody we had yeah. somebody who's from uh, Egypt yeah. and uh, she was like oh i love indian food uh, what do you like in indian food oh paneer uh, yeah. butter masala yeah. chicken so there are oh. a few dishes like dal makhani butter chicken <laughs> biryani that is uh, stereotypical of indian cuisine so when we try to educate the customers that okay there is you know irani parsi community back in mumbai and they're like irani irani iran irani people are from iran they have kebabs what are you talking about so it's a great experience to have a chat with the customers show them the images and tell them that this is what we are talking about this is a community that added so much value to the indian culture and heritage and it is our responsibility to bring it to you know a world forum which is something we see in india right like if you see india as you go towards uh, west right yeah. you go towards west you see more of these uh, rice varieties and things right and when you go up north you see more bread varieties, bread varieties yeah. Yeah. right and a lot of people don't realize how these cultures like kind of Confluence, culminates in this yes. thing right Correct. like north indians have very close food with pakistan Correct. Correct. I, i'm from south and we have a lot of food similar to sri lanka right okay. and uh, i've been into like like an iranian restaurant and their food is like very similar to what you would find in an indian restaurant with like right. slight changes right right and that's a, like a unique thing that a lot of people just don't Yeah. Understand. So I think so India is India is a a nice variety of a, a lot of different cultures <laughs> and a lot of overlaps of different cultures that has sort of happened over so many years and you know I mean uh, we we sort of try to do our level best so to sort of get that experience and that food uh, served to customers from our cafes uh, like she rightly said I mean keema pao is something a lot of people over here haven't even tried out all right know. and and it's 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 a very very good very tasty dish <laughs> all right and we serve it in our t- in the tiffin uh, in the three layer tiffin the dabba wala tiffin and we have pao we have the minced keema mutton keema and another layer with chopped onions some dhania and uh, lime and when you have it i mean it's 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 just a out of world experience uh, <laughs> a definite must try at one of our cafes so. and out of indian food what other cuisines do you so we love asian food as well So in the future once we have settled the Booker Cafe with a certain number of outlets we might venture into other restaurant concepts as well. We do love ramens, we do love all sorts of Asian food. Yeah. We are actually very very experimental. I wouldn't say no to anything. Whenever I do visit a new country as well, we do like to, you know, have the local food, local cuisine because food at the end of the day is a language. It's a representation of the people that are living there. Yeah. What about you? Same, same, Asian same, food? same. Really. <laughs> so, so we eat out quite a lot. All right, and by a lot, I mean a lot <laughs> for research. Purposes. All right, for research purposes. We call it research. We call it research. <laughs> so we have burgers, we have ramen, we have sushi, uh, we have walks, uh, we have pizzas at different places. So we we do go experimenting around town. Uh, yeah, we like our food. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's a beautiful place yeah. to yeah. end the conversation. Yeah. Thank you so Done. much for coming. It was a wonderful. Thank you so much for having us. Likewise. Likewise.